Do you like what you hear? Then you need a deaf and bass. Deaf and bass. Better by design. Whether you're old school, or whether you're new school, we discuss it all for the only one that matters. Ah, greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of For the Only One That Matters. Today's guest shares my last name because he's my son. And he is one of the most amazing musicians I have ever known or worked with. And I'm not saying that because he's my boy. I'm saying it because it's true. He has surpassed his father in so many areas. And this is a very enjoyable interview because we get to talk about some things that uh, we haven't talked about in a long time. So... Without any further ado, let's join our interview with Matt Garwood in progress. Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm going to sip some coffee. And I'm going to shut up and listen. Uh, hello, Internet. My name is Matt Garwood. I'm 42, and I teach professionally um, elementary music, general music. And he age. likes long walks on the beach. I do, I do. Long walks along the beach. Um, I teach K-5 through five general music, so I get to do the foundational stuff, and... Um, I guess professionally, that's probably the thing I do best. I think I've had more experience doing that than anything else. So taking music theory concepts and drilling them down to kids without any background knowledge or um, background vocabulary, which is fun because when you, you know, as you know, Dad, when you talk music, it's a very heady language and there's all these concepts we love to toss around. We get excited when people do interesting things with music theory that little kids is just right over their head. So learning things like steady beat and, and singing in tune and standing up straight and all those things that we all take for granted. That's the, that's what my life is. Uh, the other part of my life is as a musician. And so outside of teaching, I play a lot of different instruments. Um, I started as a drummer and I kind of throughout my life, keep getting bored and moving on to new things. So I would call myself a multi-instrumentalist. I do uh, guitar. I studied classical guitar at the university of Georgia as I got my degree there. Um, in music head. I play electric guitar. I own a mandolin. That's as far as I can say uh, about my mandolin. Um, I can play ukulele better than some beach slob, um, but that's about as good as I can play a mandolin. Um, play drums, keys, bass, love playing bass. I've played bass in a lot of the groups I've been in over the years, and I love all genres of music. I think that's something you and I share. I'd say I'd get that probably from you, just from the exposure we had growing up. But Make sure you listen to this. Make sure you listen to this. There's good in all styles of music, and there's garbage in all styles of music. So um, that's me. And and as a hobby, but that has turned into a, uh, a side business, I produce um, records. So I've done several albums of my own. And my favorite thing to do is produce for others because that lets me be off the hook as the songwriter and just take the stuff and turn it into something that sounds listenable. And that involves a lot of nerdery. And that's, that's the side of my brain I really like. I would say if I had to pick one thing out of all my musical endeavors I love the most, I would probably say it's working on the nerdy technical side of mixing and producing audio. That's my favorite. All right. All right. Now I'm pulling oh, something. Oh, I forgot to mention. And as of like three months ago, I became a church pianist, which is really funny because never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that's something I would do because I'm a drummer who's faking it. <laughs> So right. I think that's it. I think that's comprehensive. All right. Uh, I'm going to let the folks listen in on something here. I'm going to surprise you. I didn't okay. tell you I was going to do this, but hey, why not? Let's see here. Is this gotcha journalism? This is. I see Maury Povich in me. All right. Which one of these do you want? Do you think we should do? Man, I like them all. I really like, um, I don't know, man, play... Uh... Play Return of the Learn, the very first one. I like that one. All right, Return of the Learn. This is an album. This is my son. See how this is, see, he looks so serious and like in the hood. Yeah. Uh, he did an, an, a couple albums on, for kids and some uh, current music that's a lot different from the, uh, you know, uh, I love you, you love me, we're one happy family. It's, forget that purple dinosaur stuff. This stuff is cool. Give this a listen. Hey, yo, Roaring. What? What you got there in your hand, man? I am a queen. Yeah? yeah? You want to come over here and drop some sweetness on my new jam? Yeah. All right, we're about to, we're about to 
rank this thing out. You ready to help me out? One, two, I wouldn't call it a comeback. I've been here before. Spitting rhymes about fractions and planets, explorers. My flow's getting tighter than an anaconda. A record holding snake, just in case you wondered. Now I'm back in effect on this mission. Hooking rhymes on these lines, and I'm going brain fishing. It's time to decide, are you down for this ride? Flip up your lid and let your mind open wide. Uh. Man, dude, I've been right here. Daily grind, rewind, do it again, no fear. Cricket in the lab, perfecting my crap, being a dad, raising kids, and laughing laughs. Cause life is funny, man, you get these plans. But who knows the future? No man, day to day, it's a ride. Hope on to have fun, and when you get your shot, time to go big, brother. I'm telling you it's worth it. Dig deep, learn as much as you can. Yeah, you heard it. Make your mark on this world. Tell the audience hi. And if you get to do it twice, don't let it slide. With that in mind, let me introduce myself. I'm the professor. Yes, the is me yours. I'm Elia. I'm letting you know right now. I'm the sheriff of this here educational town. What? The return of the learn. I'll teach you learn all like it's never been gone. I like this one. Be a friend. I like that one. Yeah. New kid sitting next to me. I notice he dresses differently. Not the same skin, not the same hair. Looks nervous, maybe even scared. He seems to. Be a little shy, so I lean over and say hi. He smiles for the first time today. Makes me feel good, actually great. I know it's a small thing, but small things mean a lot. When you're the new kid, and small things are all you
You know, I think I feel a personal connection to that song because when I was young, you know my story about my about your Aunt Phyllis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I witnessed her. I witnessed her murder, and that affects you as a child. And me and my little brother Pat, we both witnessed the same thing. We both reacted different ways. Your uncle Pat uh, became a really tough kid. Uh, he he got in a lot of fights. Uh, he wouldn't need much of provocation before he would just take you out in the schoolyard and do what has to be done. Me, on the other hand, I became the kid that was too loud, too weird. Um, I was a strange kid in class. And I was talking with a friend of mine from the, back in those years. And uh, when I told him what had happened and why I was that weird little kid in class, he says, Paige, if those guys that bullied you, if they'd only known, I tell you right now, they would never have done what they did. I said, well, there's no way they could have known. And so, you know, I forgave him and everything, but that I could have used a friend. Mm -hmm. I could use somebody who could have, could have stepped along beside me and just been a friend to this weird little kid who acts a little bit out of the ordinary. And I'm still that weird little kid, but I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> so, so anyway, for folks that want to know, you can check out my son, Matt Garwood. And that's from his Return of the Learn, Volume 2. That means there's a Volume 1. And yep. he helps little guys and gals learn how to count, do the states of the union, learn about the different parts of their body, counting, going to the library, counting coins, telling time, all sorts of cool stuff. So Those are fun, those are fun projects because it's a little time capsule of how my oldest son sounded at the time because that's his voice that's on all those albums yes that's my grandson that you hear the little kid voice in the background so uh that's one that's one of the things that uh my son has done that i'm particularly proud of now um so I, anyway stream it buy the album show some love to a fellow musician uh i would like you and I have had lots of discussions along this, and I'm not sure we totally agree on every aspect of this discussion, but that's as it should be. Um, every father reserves the right to be right when his son is wrong, and every son reserves the right to be right when he knows his old man is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes those two boats don't even come close to the middle of the stream. But I'm talking about church and music, mm -hmm. and uh, you have some really neat some good ideas and some real head scratching, the things that make you think. Tell me about your philosophy about church music, where church and music intersects and all that, you know, just whatever comes to mind on that subject. Uh, well, I've been at so many different varieties of church over the years that I've gotten to experience a little of everything. And I'll say that um, the big overarching philosophy that should be there in church music that is sadly not often there is that it's not about you as the musician, it's about God. And that's a really nice umbrella to help you decide, okay, if I start here as my first premise, then everything else I can filter through there. Should I blah, blah, blah? Well, does it draw attention to God? Should I blah, blah, blah? Does it glorify God? Do you do blah, blah, blah? What about this kind of service? What about this kind of genre? There's no holy genres, I don't think. I think God can be worshiped through a rap song. God can be worshiped through uh, a piano ballad God can be worshipped through 16th century, you know, old school music. But so you're saying you're saying that there's no genre that's strictly secular, strictly no. sacred. No, and I, you know, this is the one place I will side on the woke weirdos. Um, they find white supremacy in everything. It feels like, but I will say that to call church music, which we all know what I mean when I say church music, right? Hymnal music. Mm -hmm. um, for most people, that's what they think of as church music. Church music is you know, three, four Oregon, or, you know, maybe we're going to get aggressive and move into the 1800s. And, and that's modern for some people. But I would say that defining music theory as the musical practices of 18th century European white musicians does reek a little bit of that supremacy mindset. And I would say calling church music this style when it doesn't sound anything like the believers in Barbados, doesn't sound anything like them in South Africa, doesn't sound anything like them in China doesn't sound anything like they do in Russia, doesn't sound anything like they do in Chile. That's ridiculous to call church music, church music and say, well, this is what's okay. And everything else feels like that would be too distracting. Well, it's just distracting because that's what you're used to. And you're not used to this other, but to say that those other people aren't truly worshiping in a variety of 
cultures is ridiculous. You know, it's amazing to me. Um, when I was uh, uh, in Russia uh, on a worship band thing over there, and I got to attend Russian churches, and their concept of church music is it's pretty inclusive, not exclusive. And there's something amazing when you hear somebody worshiping in their native tongue. And yeah. th their native tongue, do their native language doesn't necessarily embrace all the idiosyncrasies of English. So changes have to be made. Yeah. And when you hear an entire congregation in Russia sing one of their homegrown Russian songs, it just brings, gives you chills. And then you go watch uh, a worship service of a church in Africa, and here are these people jumping up and down, pogoing, in essence, and waving their hands and closed their eyes and singing praises to God. Uh, you never see that happening in an American church. But when you see it happening in that, in that culture, in that context, it's mind-blowing <laughs> that people could give themselves over to worship to that extent. So I, I had never considered that, that the definition of church music comes out of a context of the white European mindset. Yeah, it 100% does. I think that's, you know, the, I think, what's the word? Um, ethnocentrism. It's the definition of ethnocentrism. My culture is normal and everything else is only as normal as far as it lines up with my culture. So for us, we might at some places in the country view strumming acoustic guitar with nice open droney voicings like everybody did in the 90s and the 2000s, like Jars of Clay came out and then everybody wrote the same kind of chords for worship songs for 10 mm -hmm. years. Then for them, that's church music, right? Like, especially if you're my generation, you came up and that was what I learned how to play when I was learning stuff was big droney open chords and stuff like that. To some people, that would have been like really, 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 that's anathema. Like get that junk so, out of here. All right, that's, so when I was becoming a Christian sinful. in the 70s, we're talking Larry Norman, He's yep. an unidentified flying object. You will see him in the air. That was <laughs> that was different. <laughs> and then uh, second chapter of Acts, um, it was uh, some of the imperial stuff. You yep. know, they brought brought in the Southern Gospel type thing, but still, some of the uh, Keith Green. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it, it, that was church. That was church music, and to some people, it was like fingernails grating on a chalkboard because yeah. it wasn't their music yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, well look and at the music at look at the music atmosphere today all right what it, with what's going on today uh how would you describe music and the church today dysfunctional <laughs> like i'm going to let you get away with one word <laughs> <laughs> no I, that's a that's a that's a good word tell me why so Think about a dysfunctional family. It's it's a family that's not healthy in the way they relate to each other, mm -hmm. the way they treat each other. So I'll say there's not just one flavor of dysfunctional family. You can have alcoholic, abusive family. You can have the complete opposite where you're completely ignored and both are very, very unhealthy. So you can have churches where music is put up on a super high pedestal and they call it worship, which is such a, they've appropriated a term that means a whole lot. And they've decided that the first 20 minutes of Sunday morning service is what we call worship. And then you have the sermon afterwards, as if listening to the preached word is not commanded as a form of worship. If you attend to the words of your Lord and respond in your heart quietly, like a nice quiet Presbyterian, which is the flavor of church I happen to be at now, that is every bit as much a worship as the exuberant hand-waving hanky waving downtown Atlanta gospel churches where everybody is cranking their PAs up to deafening levels because God is worshiped through culture and culture is man. It's human stuff. So since God is worshiped through our culture, not apart from our culture, our culture imparts upon it, all the good stuff we carry along as presuppositions and all the bad stuff we carry along as presuppositions. So I, I would call it dysfunctional because if you're at a church where music is way up here, and I hear this from a lot of people. Music is how you put butts in seats. I think there's even a quote from Sister Act. <laughs> well, there's a good evangelical source. <laughs> and, and hey, Sister Act and Sister Act 2 are in my top 10 maybe favorite movies ever. Not uh -huh. Sister Act. And I'm not Catholic, but oh, those nuns got down. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if you, put, if you put music up here and you say this is church or more specific, this is the way we reach culture, right? 
So we have the we have the the disco lights, we have the screens, we have the laser, we have the projection wall. Don't forget the smoke. Entire, Don't forget the it, smoke. There's entire YouTube channels that are the literally the nerdy side of me is so excited to watch it. They're the height of technology. There's people taking products that were never meant to integrate together and putting on a sensory experience that rivals when I've seen, I mean, I've seen world world class acts like Sting in concert multiple times. And I'll tell you, I've seen churches that have bigger, better lighting, sound and video walls and impact and clear monitors and multiple headphone mixes and 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 lyrics that do this and then there's transitions and everything is the most polished show ever. I've seen churches that put on a show better than Sting. And I think that's dysfunctional. It's got to be viewed as dysfunctional because our our okay, if Christianity is commanded by the Bible to come and worship their God in the manner in which he has prescribed. And I think he's given us this wide allowance for how, but it's not like there's no boundaries, right? Because if there's any boundaries, if we can worship God any way, he wouldn't have broken the golden calf. He wouldn't have been upset with the strange fight. It's funny you mentioned that. I just finished the golden calf in my devotionals. I, and, I, think, I, uh, I think I saw that on there, yeah. Mm. So like, if God, if God says there's no boundaries, then we get to worship him however we want to. But your Bible tells you that man is inherently sinful and that the heart is wicked above all other things and that out of man's heart comes his uh, his true desires are, are manifested. Well, we're sinful. And if you start there, then we shouldn't maybe trust our instincts as much as we think we should. And well, so you, you know, to me, it's a symbiotic thing between the congregant and the musician. Yeah. And I, I was at a church. I was on staff at a church for a long time, and you know that, um, as a bass player. And it used to distress me so much after church service, people would come up and say, man, you are really ripping it on the bass today. And inside, there's a part of me that went, then you missed it. Yeah. You, you weren't watching God, you were watching me. And that broke my heart because that meant I was part of the problem. Yeah. And But only and, one part. But only one part. It's only one Just one part. part. I can't, I'm, I don't take responsibility for their re reaction. But for a musician, and you know this as a musician, uh, God made us to be musicians. And when we play, all right, it's that Eric Liddell thing from Chariots of Fire. When his sister's mm -hmm. asking him, why do you like to run so much? He says, because, because when I run, I see, because God made me to be fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I feel his pleasure. Yeah. And that is the greatest description. When, when, a, when a person finds, knows what God, the gifts that God's given them, and they're operating within that gift set, it's, you're doing what God made you to do. You're being what God made you to be. And that in and of itself is, is worship, can be, and should be. And so now I'm in a church now where it's, it's real. I, I've been there now for like 10 or 11 years. And I played guitar. I played electric guitar. I played bass in the worship bands and uh, at multiple services. And I have yet to have anybody come up to me and do anything except, wow. It was like God was in the room today, or wow, the, the worship just blessed me. Thank you. But they, they didn't made no mention to any, any of the players, and we got high-powered musicians in that, uh, in, that church, in our church. And I think that's closer, at least that meets my, it kind of meets my criteria. Yeah. If somebody's there truly worshiping, then whoever's on the stage shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. And if the musician is worshiping when he plays, He's not going to do it in such a way as to make himself the center of that stage. Yeah. You know, so there, it's a, there's a, give, a push and push and pull thing there. But um, and I oh. think that's where that's where wisdom comes in. Right. Is knowing what is likely to be perceived on the receiver's end. You have to be cognizant of that. You can't just say, well, I had my heart in the right place. You took it wrong. And that's why that's what I meant when I said you were only part of the thing, because there's yeah. transmission and then there's the receiving. You didn't intend it, but is a certain genre in a certain culture likely to be perceived as showy and look at me? Yeah. And I think that's different across cultures. I think what's, what's going to be distracting in Covington, Georgia, might not be distracting in the Congo. Hmm. Okay. I like that. You know, so, also, yeah. it's like, um, and I, I know you've seen this uh, throughout the, throughout the, the decades, when somebody, it happens in the recording industry. Um, my beef with the recording industry has been that up until about the mid eighties, the thing was to be different. Yeah. But then the first boy band came out. What might, was a boys to men maybe? Um, 
I would probably say the Jacksons were a boy band with the same kind of fervor or the Beatles were a young men's boy I'm band. I'm talking about the acapella choral thing. So that yeah. would be like boys to men. Boys to men. Four guys sure. singing. Yeah, in the 90s, the boys to men thing took over. And then what happened? Then what happened? All of a sudden, every record label had to have a boys to men type yeah, thing sure. happening. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, then the recording industry became, when something new came out, everybody rushed to recreate that sound, that vibe it, for their label so they can get in on the money-making thing. Well, the same thing happens in the Christian churches. You know, I have, I've met Matt Redman. The mm -hmm. guy is the most genuine person on the face of the planet, and he would absolutely recoil at the thought of people emulating him and his trying to emulate him or his success. With He, he writes music from the heart. His songs are great. Chris Tomlin, same way. Um, all those, and yet, the minute those guys hit the scene, it seems like almost every church had to have a Chris Tomlin lookalike, or all of a sudden skinny jeans, spiked hair, uh, hipster thing took over. A fedora I, for after service. <laughs> yeah, and I was actually, I was actually asked by, a, I was asked into a church, a major church in the Metro Atlanta area, to speak with me about the possibility of coming on staff as a staff musician player. And I was told that uh, that they they were they weren't going to have me on after all because um, I was a little too old and and I didn't fit the image. That was what their words were. Now what they were saying was I was too fat and I don't look good in skinny jeans. And I I get that. Put me in skinny jeans, dude. That's ten pounds. That's twenty five pounds of potatoes in a ten pound sack. I get it. <laughs> but but they but. The image was the thing mm. rather than the music, the thing. The fact that I played bass for 40 years and I have more music theory nonsense dancing around in my head than most people got brain cells means nothing. Mm. I didn't look good in skinny jeans and spiked hair and that kind of stuff. And uh, and that's another thing about the church I'm at right now. It's, it's a very weird mega church. It's technically a mega church. But when the worship pastor asked me to come and play, he said, I said, well, you know, I, I don't do the skinny jeans thing. He said, can you play? I said, yeah, 40 years. He said, okay, you're on, let's go. And uh, so I totally get, I'd like your viewpoint on culture. We can't worship apart from our culture. It'd be ridiculous. Can you imagine if we tried to authentically worship like the South Americans do? <laughs> we would, we, we'd look stupid. We'd be yeah, stupid. We, we wouldn't do it authentically, and therefore, what are we doing? We're just going through the motions, and we're in our head instead of in heaven, where we should be during our worship services. We're mm. not touching the divine. We're thinking about what's not natural and why this feels weird. And that's why what's important in church is that we have this overarching idea of that it is not time for us to... I've heard people describe it like I gotta go. I gotta go to church. Get charged up. Like I go to. I go to my. I had a person I used to go to church with. They used to say they go to our church, but about once every six or seven weeks they would go to this church for one Sunday because they just got to get their worship on. What in the world? Oh. Is that? What in the world is that? That's mm. so. It's so gross. And like you said, with people trying to chase trends and everything, let's ask you a theological question. Which one of the Ten Commandments is called idolatry? The very first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Go later in the list. Not actual idolatry, but one of the other ones is referred to in Scripture as... Graven image. Idolatry. The one about graven images? You're too on the nose. It's one of the ones that doesn't sound like idolatry, but it's called idolatry later on in Scripture. All right, teach your old man something. Go. When you are not satisfied with what you want, and you are chasing after what other people want, it's referred to as idolatry later on. <gasps> oh, what was that the ninth or the tenth commandment? I'm blanking right coveting. now. Coveting. You're talking yeah. about coveting. Which is idolatry. So you see this church's success over here, and what are they doing? Well, we got to do that. Wow. Egypt had a real simple, clear, right in front of your eyes form of worship. We got to have that. And I can't imagine another form of worship. So real quick, whip us up a calf we can bow down to. Oh, now, 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 let's, let's. It's let's give, Aaron, let's give Aaron props. It's not like he did anything. He told Moses, he said, look, we threw the gold in the fire and out came a calf. Yeah, me and me and my sister said that same thing when we got in trouble multiple times. It wasn't me, it was her. She'd say, it wasn't me, it was her. <laughs> yeah. Rarely the whole story, isn't it? 
Yeah. Well, we usually believed your sister because she's better looking than you are. So she was usually telling the truth too. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because uh, uh, as a bass player and a guitar player, I found myself gravitating uh, less and less to the show side of the house. Now, I get, I get that I, I, I understand production value, and mm -hmm. you want to make sure the music is clear for the congregation to hear. So you don't want it to be over loud, overly loud. And you don't want to have all these effects and lights flashing all that kind of stuff to draw attention away from whatever the song is trying to to do, but um, but man, you I, you can really go over the top of that stuff. And again, I think your criteria, and I think my criteria, we share the same thought. Um, at the end of the day, what was your focus? If your focus was, wow, I felt like God was sitting in the chair next to me, then I think you did your job. And I think once you define worship, if once you define worship incorrectly, you'll be on the wrong road no matter how hard you try. If you define worship as this thing that fills your heart or that thing that pours into you. Worship is us pouring out. Well, worship is not just singing with the band. Yes. We it's are the required word. by God. We are not called on the Lord's Day by Scripture to go and be fed. We are called by worship to obey, and he has called a meeting, and we are required to attend. And when we attend, we are to worship him in spirit and in truth, which is what was promised after Jesus left. We no longer worship God locally in a place. We worship him through the spirit wherever we are. Where two or more are gathered, he's there. And since he's there, who should be the CEO running that show? It's not the guy in the skinny jeans. And it's certainly not the person with outreach minded music sensibilities. It's so easy to go down that road because once you decide worship is what we do here, and then the sermon is something different, you either end up elevating worship to an unnaturally high state where that's all you care about. And then there's the sermon and he's going to do 15 minutes and we can all go buy barbecue. I've been at churches like that. Yeah. Where it's like, it's like, okay, snap, snap, snap. Come on. But you know, but 45 minutes for music is one thing. Or we got to beat the Methodist to golden corral have to or they'll eat all the Southbury steak um or you get the other way where music is music is not appreciated where it's not excellent where there's not excellent musicians doing it and nobody cares because what it's really about is the ego of the pastor it's a cult of personality kind of church and for those people if, if the man running the show doesn't really care or these days the woman running the show if the pastor running the show does not care about the music then who cares because it's really about me let's hurry up and get to me and both of those are incredibly dysfunctional. If you have a distractedly untalented music leader, nobody can worship well. You're supposed to have excellent priests. You're supposed to have excellent musicians playing with excellent gifts for God. So it's not okay to go on this side where you treat it like a gig and it's a paid, you know, gun, hired gun show where all the best people in town vie for the thing. And, and you're not supposed to go on the other side either where you don't offer anything that's good. And so where do you find that middle ground? It's kind of like, I don't know if you ever heard of the definition of pornography that came out in the eighties. I forget. It was, I think it was with like Al Gore and his wife. I think they were a big part of it. And either Al Gore or his wife said something like, well, they asked him to define where is the line on what is explicit? Cause I think him and his wife were behind the big push to put the explicit lyric sticker on things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think either Al Gore or his wife said it, pornography is like this. I know it when I see it. And they didn't want to define it more clearly than that. You didn't want to say you can do this, but not this. As soon as you cross this line, it's pornographic because you know what humans will do. They'll play with where that line is and say, ah, oh, I didn't break that rule. So as soon as we define worship looks like this, you're going to have people messing with it. I think it's much more wise to say it's true worship and I know it when I feel it or I know it when I see it. Keep these big, safe like limited government conservative roles. Let's have the church government and the standard be very loosey goosey. Let us let the free market decide. But within that, you have to have the understanding that man is inherently sinful. Man's inherently prideful. And we're going to intentionally skew things to be in our benefit and somebody else, you know, with our foot on somebody else's neck. Mm -hmm. So we're either, and sometimes our foot is on Jesus's neck, which stinks. We're not trying to steal attention from the kid at school. If you do that junk on Sunday, you're stealing attention from your king. That is treasonous. Uh, yeah, it didn't end well for those who tried that in the Old Testament. No, a lot of piles of salt. A lot of piles of salt. Yeah. Some, a, lot of, a lot of fire from heaven. 
Yeah. Well, it's all right. So now, in your in your uh, um, you're in a Presbyterian church right now, and yep. you and I are both reformed in the way we think. I think you're more reformed than I am. I think I don't, I'm not sure. I'm a total tuliper. I might be a tulai. No, Let's see, total depravity. You is. Uh, <laughs> don't leave me hanging unconditional <laughs> unconditional yeah uh yeah. and limited atonement mm. uh I'm, I'm good so far mm. i would be what irresistible call irresistible grace irresistible call mm. and p would be pizza see that's why i'm a presbyterian <laughs> t-u-l-i-p <laughs> ends with pizza <laughs> yeah but it, you know it's so within that culture mm it would be probably an incredibly wrong thing to bring in a Brooklyn Tabernacle vibe. Yeah, I mean, we just did a church service um, last Sunday night that I've been putting together for a couple of weeks and we're pushing a couple of new ideas, but I knew wisely, I hope, if we had radically changed, since I've just come on staff there, if I had radically changed what people were expecting, it would be like distracting and it wouldn't be in a moment for them to really truly experience the presence of the divine, which is, I think, a very healthy thing for us to spend time in church in the presence of the divine, not telling God what's up, but listening to what the spirit tells us is what <laughs> I love that. Not telling yeah. God what's up. <laughs> yeah, I'm here to tell you how it is. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing. I was just the thought occurred to me as well, that you're 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 in a small church. Yes. Yeah. So why would you do a big Herculean production mm. for a small congregation? Whatever you do musically has to fit your body of believers yeah we did we did one number at the end that was was as rocking as it got that was it and most of the other stuff was was in that yeah, way yeah but you're sneaking that su you're sneaking that black gospel stuff in there and that old hymn i love it but yeah i mean everybody's used to a certain thing so if that they, if they're constantly being jarred then you're you're making it uh uncomfortable as soon as it's uncomfortable, people pay attention to their feelings. So I have to be wise in what I choose. So we did eight songs that sounded. And then we had one that was. And so that was a wise choice. And I'm trying to make sure that when we make changes, we make subtle changes. Well, you I'm know, right. it's it's uh, all right. I At one time, I thought God was calling me to be a worship pastor. And I'm so glad he didn't because. Um, I have all the a lot of the prerequisite gifts. Of course, I have a music thing happening, but my three primary spiritual gifts are teaching, administration, and prophecy. Perfect leadership enabling type skills for somebody who's in charge of a ministry. But the one gift that's missing in my heart is mercy. When I did the spiritual gifts test, I had a pastor say, I can tell you right now why you're not a worship pastor. I said, what? He said, you know, your three highest gifts, teaching, administration, prophecy, great, good job. Mercy, you're at two percent. He says nobody will make it out of your rehearsal alive. <laughs> he said if you're going to be in the if you're going to be in any kind of a pastoral role, mercy has to be there. And but so, and at times that's frustrating to me because I have the technical skills to pull it off. But yeah, he's absolutely right. Whiny adults throw me around the bend. Yeah. I can deal with kids, but whiny adults, oh, I will, I will just, I'll hit you with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I have, I, you know, like I, I'm thinking about your job as a minister of music at your little church and how out of order it would be if I were to bring what my church does in a, you know, a, a large Baptist church and bring my worship team and production team into your little church and do one of our worship services because uh, with, you know, three, two guitars, bass, drums, a whole huge drum set, two keyboard players, three singers, 
and how out of order that would be. Yeah. But now in my church, we pull it off and there's, it's worship that happens because again, I think that's back to the cultural thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You have to be sensitive to your people. And when you're leading worship for your people, your end, the end goal for you has to be at the end of the, at the end of the music, not the worship service, notice what I said, at the end of the music, have you primed the pump for them to hear the voice of God through the word? The, I see music as a prelude. If, if you were to look at a, it, it, and put it within a song context, the music is the prelude and the theme and variations is the presentation of the word of God. He presents the word, he applies the word, and then and then you do a, a postlude, which would be you come back to music and remind people about what God just told them. So it's, uh, yeah. and, and if and you were to come to our church and bring what you did, likewise, it wouldn't fit. Yeah. For probably the same, because of the cultural thing. So I'm just, good thoughts. I mean, I've played in bar bands before where we had to consider we're at a bar. They don't want to hear uh, that really technical Rush song that we're all so proud we learned how to play. We can do YYZ. Go ahead and let you guys get to dance to YYZ. I have played YYZ in a bar before, and two people, both drummers, clapped their heads off when we were finished. <laughs> and everybody else, everybody else had gone to buy drinks. <laughs> And came back out as soon as, what's your name, little girl, what's your name? As soon as Skinner came back on, here they come. Metallica will get them out there, but, you know, forget your seven, eight weird time signature, rushed poetic nonsense. But, you know, that stuff has a place if you're playing that stuff for Rush fans. That you oh, know. by the way, you can't see it, but I have a t-shirt on that says, these are difficult times, and it has like seven, eight, and 13, four. <laughs> Only the sum. Like... <laughs> you know what's really funny? While we're on the subject of, con uh, of culture, um, Bella Fleck, you know, one of my biggest musical heroes, Bella Fleck had that documentary he did um, where he went back to Africa to chase the, the roots yes. of the show. And he goes from West Africa to Central Africa to East Africa to South Africa to, to Morocco to Egypt and all these places around Africa. And they all treat the instrument differently. And he got to some places where he was trying to write out and transcribe what they're doing because each place they went, they tried to come up with some kind of like, I play with the local talent sort of part, and that's going to make a cool documentary. And what ended up being really funny was there was a scene where he was like, and this is, he showed him, he was like, this is like three sheets of staff paper. I haven't had the same time signature in a back to back measures yet. They don't think like that. So I'm done doing this. And to them, music theory was completely different. It absolutely had a structure, but he could not understand it through the lens of, I have four beats in this measure, three beats through this. I have this key signature this time. What they thought of was way more of shapes and stories being told through the music. And to them, again, this is something I, I think he brought up, was that to them, music cannot be divorced from dancing. Music does not exist when you sit down. If people are sitting down, hmm. listening, what are you doing? That's not music. It wasn't saying that that was a lesser form of music. It was saying it's inextricably linked. Music happens and people dance to it. There you is see no that in their thing. church culture. So why is it okay for them to dance in churches when I would say it is highly distracting to do it in an Episcopalian church with the robes and everything? Because their culture is different. And it is not unholy for you to do something as long as it draws glory to God and people to God and not glory to you or people to other people. But as soon as you have the dude who's got the gelled hair doing the thing and he's got all the patch changes set up on his overly complicated pedal board, like why do you have eight drive pedals, dude? Why do you have four delay pedals? And by the time you have this whole like, I mean, isn't that the joke? I mean, that's the meme of worship guitarist. If I tell you worship guitarist, what do you immediately think of? A giant board with way too many delays and a guy who plays one note things with cascading delays, right? That's every guitar player knows that's what you do. It's like, it's like the church just decided cold play is church music and let's do that. So they all sound like dreamy soundscapes mm. now, but, and I love making dreamy soundscapes. I adored making music like that. And I would go see a Christian rapper. I would not want a Christian rapper unless I could think of a set of circumstances where it would work, I would probably not want one on the Lord's day because by its definition, MCs are drawing attention to themselves. It is 
yes. really hard for that genre to point outward. I do think there's people who do it well. And I think for my personal edification and going to a concert, I love Toby Mac. I love Lecrae. I love KB. I love Andy Mineo. I love a whole bunch of Christian rappers, but they would be out of place on Sunday morning. Well, because the congregant can't sing with them. And there's your, and there's your uh, philosophy of worship. Does your church value congregational worship or does your church value excellent performance where they sort of worship for you and you passively consume it? Because if you take congregational churches, which is the, the idea at our church, if you take congregational churches and I'm not there, they will worship. If you take a big performance-based church and those people try to go to any other setting, they almost don't know how to personally worship because they've been accustomed to, you do it for me. And they, mm -hmm. they raise their hands and do this. And they do this. And they know all the times when you're supposed to be emotionally manipulated by that third rise and fall of the courses. They know all that stuff. And now there's, it's like you've, it's like you've become addicted. There's a drug you can't get out. You do the worshiping for me at those churches, because how could a person compete with their personal worship in the chair? How could they compete with lasers and smoke and fog? They can't. It's like it overloads the senses to the point where if I offer anything, now I feel out of place. Mm -hmm. So have you created an environment that encourages people to do what God commanded them? You know, it's or amazing. Have you made it a place where it's hard for them to do it. God commanded them to come to your building and worship him. And you stood there as a stumbling block and played excellent music. And you don't see the problem with it. When I was the, the service that I got saved at in boot shots camp, fired, dad, shots fired, shots fired. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> when I, uh, the service I got saved at was a black full gospel Pentecostal church that came into boot camp and held church service. Now, I grew up in a small fishing village in Southeast Alaska. I think there was one black kid that I knew for a couple of years, and then their family moved away. And I'd never seen that many black people in one place in all my life. And But these were, this was blue, this is purple robes, big, gorgeous black women shaking the hankies, right? Tambourine with the little flowy thingies off the end. And that music, they worshipped... <sighs> They were a lot like you'd expect an African church service. I mean, there was dancing, there was, it was glorious. And that music washed over me and I was gloriously saved under that ministry. And I think the reason was because the way they played, it was authentic mm -hmm. to them. This wasn't just them putting on a show, they worshiped mm -hmm. and you were invited to join. Now. It was not like any worship service this little white boy had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I doubt if I, I would never try to pull off a worship service like that, because if you ever see me start, start to dance, dude, it's time to leave the room. But, but it was authentic. Yeah. And in the same way that your children's choir singing a simple little song would be authentic. When it's, I think what's, when it's authentic, it communicates, the Holy Spirit communicates. And that's why I think you're wise and not, setting up boundaries but you'll know it when you see it kind of thing yeah uh, I, I think that is totally totally within within your rights ah dude and that's where that's where knowing something about music theory comes in handy right knowing how to structure a song knowing how to program a service so this song leads into this song so that these keys harmonize so these things harmonize because there's this intrinsic thing people who don't know music theory will gravitate to things that are harmonious things that gel and it's up to our it's up to our expertise to be able to put those things together in a way that that leads people where we want to lead them without ever resorting to the emotional manipulation of modern charismatic worship, which is so wrong. That bullying pressure to raise your hand, speak in tongues, raise your hand, do this. God's here for you. Somebody touch somebody and say, blah, 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 blah. And the organ goes off like that whole style of worship can never be authentically done because it always points you back at the cult of personality with the microphone. It's always man centered. Even when they're talking about Jesus, it's, it's them that's getting the glory for a second. Oh man, you should hear him preach. Oh, you should hear him play. You hear her sing that solo. Hmm. They leave church talking about her. They have, they have no rem They don't remember the sermon. They don't leave yeah. feeling small in the sight of a powerful God. They leave feeling pretty pumped up. It's funny, the, the service before that black service, it was a Southern Gospel 
uh, I mean, it was a Southern Baptist preacher, Hellfire and Brimstone preacher, and he preached about heaven and hell, and he was old school, air sucking type preacher, and the Lord, <gasps> kind of thing. But he, he described heaven, you could hear the angels singing. He described hell, and you could feel the fire, the flames licking up around your ankles. And totally different vibe, totally different style, but you heard God in the middle of it, because again, they were authentic. He was more interested in it. That was just the way he presented the word, but he was very concerned with presenting the word. Mm -hmm. And th that black gospel choir preacher, they were authentic at the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. And uh, it, those two services changed my life. Yeah. And uh, awesome stuff. Ah, you know what? We're, we'll do this again. Now, here's, because I, I have another appointment I got to go to. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're going to do at our next time we get together. Hmm. I want you to consider uh, sharing your process uh, for writing a song. Uh, okay. Maybe um, you're working on an album right now for... For Ty Rumble. For Ty Rumble. Yeah. That would be really, really cool to see your process. Like, And the question I have, and a lot of people always ask me this, is um, what do you do when you don't know what to do? So I want to give I want you to give some thought to that next time we get together. Um, that was the by the way that was the core of my thesis for my master's degree, is how do you get your muse to come off the porch and play with you? I, every every musician's inspired at some point. Everybody every musician that I know has written a song at some point uh, because the words the words and the music just flow and everything. But what about when you're under a deadline and you sit down at your piano and you stare at the music paper? and the notes don't magically appear, what do you do? I would like that to be the next topic of our discussion. Spoiler, athletes don't always feel like training, but if it's your job, and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, spoiler alert. Yeah. Son, I appreciate you. Thank you for this. This is, uh, I, this is exactly the kind of conversation I wanted to have. And uh, folks, my son, Matt Garwood, go check out his Return of the Learn. Do some listening. Go check out and find Ty Rumble if you want to hear Matt's uh, most recent work. And Ty Rumble has a ministry of scripture songs. His first album uh, is aimed at children. His second album is a little bit, I don't know, is a mature word? Uh, well, he and, I have, he and I have collaborated. This is our third word-for-word uh, -word album. He's done other projects without me. He, he's done a lot of children's songs and rap songs. And when he and I have done the word-for-word -word things, it's been taking a, a, a Bible verse, including the scripture reference and putting it into a way that gets people to remember it. And um, so it's grown from being something he did with all of his kids to some of his kids to now, I guess it's kind of grown up because we're, we're changing too. We don't want to make the same album over and over, but we're about to finish uh, volume three. So if you check out word for word, volume one or volume two, um, you can check out what we've already done. And volume three should be done. Lord willing, very soon. We're at, we're at the end now. You know, that might make an interesting broadcast podcast is to have you and him mm -hmm. maybe we can have uh we can hook him up he can dial we'll dial him in and have like a three-way conversation about that because that would be a good thing i i'd like to see the process you two go through yeah in writing a song because i i heard where one of your songs started and i've mm -hmm. heard where one of you that same song ended and the two are different yeah they are <laughs> that's fun <laughs> so i'd be it'd be cool to see how it happens well, hey, my next guest is here, so I'm going to hang up from you. Um, tell my grandkids I love them, and I hope they I hope they feel better soon. All right, we'll do. All right, love you, son. Be good. Love you, Dad. Bye.